Tēhei Māori ora, ki te awa, ki te whenua, ki te moana o Tarangi, haere, haere, haere. Tēnā koutou katoa, ko kai whakahaere o Lock Government New Zealand. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you for the invitation, Mayor John, and thank you to all of you for turning up today. Look, just a little bit of background. I'm not a PR man. I'm not a spin doctor for the mining industry. Um, I don't have that in my body. I'm, I'm actually more involved in the community development and economic development side, social responsibility aspects. Um, yes, I do deal with the media and I do uh, do public relations work. Um, but very much what we want to talk about today is very much that corporate social responsibility aspect and how the royalties for regions was involved in that. Some of you may be surprised that I, my degree is actually in parks and recreational management. And one of the last things I did before I went to um, the mining sector seven years ago was I was chairman and head facilitator of the New Zealand and Australian Parks Forum. So that kind of um, shocks a few people who don't like what I do now. Um, <clears throat> but that's cool. I think I come from both sides of the fence and so we can talk about these things pretty accurately. Um, what I will cover off today um, is a bit of background about Newmont because there's a bit of a PR aspect. And then I want to talk a little bit about the Australian mining context because that sets the scene for the Royalties for Regions program. We'll go through the Royalties for Regions program and what it tries to achieve. Now, luckily for me, um, they have just uh, completed a uh, survey on the results of the Royalties for Regions program and what the impacts have. So I just grabbed that and I'm going to share with you some of the high principles that have come out of that survey because I think it's the key principles um, that we are seeing uh, sorry, the key outcomes that we've seen from the Royalties for Regions program that are going to be fundamental to you in your debate with central government about what are the principles by which you, you set your framework. And we can talk about those and I can identify those for you. And I think, um, having a, a quick talk to my Waihi colleagues, um, that uh, they will align up pretty well. So um, this we're going to do, um, and then we're going to do questions at the end of the panel. Is that right? Yep, Something like that? Correct. Cool. If I'm going too fast, I'm going to slow down. It's nice to be back in New Zealand. Um, so Newmont Mining, we're a big miner, uh, second biggest gold miner in the world. Uh, we employ lots of staff. Uh, we're in five continents and uh, in Australia, New Zealand region, which I cover, we're in uh, three operations in New Zealand. We did have four, we recently sold one and obviously the Waihe operation in New Zealand. We also used to look after Indonesia. That was a fun place to work, uh, I can tell you. So, um, just in terms of uh, sort of economies, when you look at what mining does, this is the percentage of local goods and services we buy in different places. Ghana is a really interesting one because of the lack of service and infrastructure. We only um, purchase 6% of our goods and services from Ghana, but interestingly enough, one mine makes up 2% of their GDP. And when we proudly said that to government, they said, is that all? So, you know, we can talk about scale, but um, that's the sort of impact we've got around the globe. This is where we are in the Asia Pacific region. Um, if I push this button here, um, we, I get to sit in Perth and go to all these cool places. Uh, if you've been to Kalgoorlie, who's seen Kalgoorlie cops on TV? Yeah. It's not like that at all, right? <laughs> Most places are like that on a Friday, Saturday night, but Kalgoorlie has that element, but it's not like that all the time. Um, Bonington's just out of uh, Perth. Tanami is one of the most remote places in the world. Um, and is literally in the middle of nowhere, and uh, I'm not sure if you can see it, but why he? Uh, going the wrong way. So look, um, in terms of Asia Pacific, well, we're a big player in terms of Newmont's total gold production and its copper production that comes out of Bonington. Um, you may also be interested to know that why he does a lot of silver, around 500,000 ounces of silver as well as 100,000 ounces of gold. Uh, well, we also get uh, cop copper and gold uh, uh, porphyries, which is what we've got in uh, Bonington. Um, we expect to produce around 1.6 to 1.7 million ounces this year uh, across the region, 60 to 7 million pounds of copper. Um, we employ around 4,500 people. So Boddington, a little bit about it, it's our biggest gold mine. Uh, to put it in context, if anyone, has anyone been to Perth? Okay, it's the size of the operation is this, if you walk from one end of Perth CBD to the other, that's about walking the length of the hole in the ground. Um, 700,000 ounces of gold, 66 million pounds of copper, it's a low grade deposit, it's all on volume, uh, it's a big contributor to our portfolio all over. Um, and that's where it is, it operates in a, a state forestry area, uh, we also own private forestry land, it's an agricultural um, setup in the little town of Boddington, which is just here, is about 
14 k's away, similar, uh, <coughs> about a quarter of the size of Waihe. Um, Kalgoorlie is the one, the famous one that you see on TV all the time with the police running around. Um, again, big operation, you may have heard of it, uh, referred to as the Super Pit. Um, it's a joint venture between ourselves and Barrick, Barrick being the biggest gold miner in the world. Um, another big contributor around 66, uh, 664,000 ounces. Uh, and that's it there, so just like Waihe, here is the town, there is the operation. Tanamai is the mine that's in the middle of nowhere in the Tanamai Desert, fantastic place, you should all go there and visit it one day. Um, to give you a feel about our local, our local community, um, the larger Manu people are 333 kilometres away, which takes five hours to get there on a four-wheel drive. Everything is fly and fly out, and Yuindamu is the other community, which is 327 kilometres the other way. Um, bit of a picture, and there's lots of that all around the place. Lots of this stuff, that is. So then there's Waihi, which um, probably no stranger to any of you here. 110,000 ounces, the Martha Pit, which has been going as a historical uh, uh, operation, and of course uh, now focused on underground mining, both uh, in exploration uh, for future operations and also within the town itself. You may have seen that photo. So, what is the Australian context? Right, world leader in iron ore uh, and gold and copper, uh, oh, sorry, bauxite, and one of the top four producers in terms of these other commodities. So it's, mining is a big part of what we do in Australia, it's a big part of the economy. Um, clearly in the last decade we've had year on year growth in demand, largely driven by China and India, particularly for gold, um, and now the mineral sector accounts for 60% of its annual exports. So it's a big player in terms of how we do things. Um, in, in terms of what the value of that, it's now approximately $130 billion in terms of exports, and that's up from $40 billion just a decade earlier. Now that's um, a combination of production increases, the number of new mines and operations, but also rising commodity prices. So uh, what's what was really interesting is that mining investment in the last um, 12 months, or sorry, the last two years, uh, 2012, actually made 6% of the GDP alone. So normally operations used to sit around three, but just the capital investment into new projects. So you hear a lot about the Australian boom. It wasn't the Australian mining boom. We're going, it was the Australian mining construction boom. So it was all the construction of mines and the setup and the um, people that we had to get in to do that. And largely led by iron ore. So um, we've contributed more than 40 billion company tax and royalties over the last two years. So that's the whole industry. So big numbers. Um, <clears throat> roughly accounts for 10% of our GDP all up and pays about 25% of most of the Australian company tax. The reason I'm telling you all this is that that sets a context for the scale of the, of the Royalties for Regions program and how it accounts for WA. Um, gold mining, uh, clearly close to our heart, largest gold reserves, domestic mine production, 226 tonnes, around eight to 9,000 ounces, um, and 70% of that was in Western Australia. And 70% of all production out of the mine industry comes from Western Australia. So um, unlike New Zealand, this states, state governments received the royalties rather than the central government and that was an accident of history because way back in 1901 when the six independent colonies came together to form the Federation, the Constitution of Australia, or the East Coast sites, or oh, there's nothing in WA, they'll take you what you like, uh, and the states get hold of the royalties and now we're laughing. So um, it's all good fun. Australia was a good place to be a couple of weeks ago uh, on a Saturday evening. Um, so I'm not sure if you can see all these numbers. Can you, can you guys see these numbers here? Should we move these for a bit? Numbers are important. They're not everything, but they kind of set up context. So since we're talking about royalties, um, total mineral royalty for the, for the whole of the nation was $9.977 billion. So that's just the royalties from the exports across. And you can see there in WA, 5.7 billion. That's the royalties that come back into the WA sector. Um, and when you look at that with tax and royalties all up, so there's the 9.977, and then the company tax at 11 gives you 22, 19 last year gives you the 40 billion that we've made or contributed in tax and royalties. So big scale. Um, but I, the reason I wanted to put that up was people go, oh, well, the scale's big, the numbers are big, that's why they do it. The issues and what I hope to get through to you today is the issues that the Royalties for Regions program are trying to address are the same that regional New Zealand face. 
and that the application and some of the principles they've got around the program are the same and that would help you address your framework when discussing with Parliament. So gold, again, just some numbers. Um, really just to point out uh, that Newmont Waihe Gold in the last six years had an average of 5.7 million on tax and around 1.26 million in royalties on an annualised basis. So people go, oh, you guys don't pay very much in royalties, but yes, that's because we also pay company tax and there's not many other industries that pay both company tax and royalties. So even though it might be a smaller number depending on what comes back out of that 1.26 million, that coming back on a regular basis over the life of mine for mining community is actually quite significant to get projects like the Gold Discovery Centre up. So what's a royalty? You know, I just wanted to put this up there, it's not a tax, and we keep saying, oh, it's tax and regulation, it's not a tax, right? A tax goes up and down depending on your profit, a uh, royalty you pay regardless. So if you make a loss, you still pay a royalty because it's based on production and it's based on commodity price at the time. Um, so just in terms of Western Australia, gold pays around 2.5% and the gold sector is currently in a debate with the uh, WA government because they're looking to increase that. So we are having discussions. And as we said, um, what's really interesting is that, oops, sorry, royalties contribute nearly a quarter of the revenue of the state government. So um, $5 billion of royalties straight into the um, revenue of the state government. Now that's actually led to a downturn in their uh, credit ratings from Paws and, and uh, Standard Paws and Moody's because they believe the volatility of the market is um, such that that's too high a level contribution from royalties. So that's going to be an interesting debate about royalties for regions. And we're already seeing the effect of that because they've now capped royalties for regions to a billion dollars a year. So originally it was 25%, now they've capped it to a billion dollars. So what was it basically premised on? It was premised on the basis of a minority party at the time, the Nationals, led by um, Brendan Grillis. He was a, a, a minority partner with the Liberal government during a tight state election. Um, the Liberals needed Mr Grillis's party to come online to get them over the line. And his view was, we need to have C25% of those returning to the region. And that was back in 2008. Um, and as I said, it's been capped at a billion dollars now but it's premised on that 25% being returned to the regions by where the revenue comes from. So not all of it, a percentage of it. And I think that'll be a debate for you guys around what is that percentage and how should that happen. <clears throat> We've de and the state, they've divided the state into nine different regions just to make it work and uh, I'll explain that further. So, commenced in 2008, really was that change in terms of uh, the way that royalties as money is spent. So much like uh, here it is in New Zealand, the, fund went in, the money's went into a general fund and it was just spread across the activities of government. This now actually sets up for very strict priorities around where 25% of those funds will go and the process by which they will be spent. And one of the um, key, and I think this is very key to getting this over the line, is that they're very big on that this money's from these funds are not for new projects. They're not to recreate something from um, state government that the local government can't do. It's not to duplicate or come up with some ideas because there's some money to spend. The money must be spent on existing um, services and infrastructure or plans that are in play as we speak that have had local involvement and that have gone through a, a local process to identify the priorities for them. And that's key. And, and that, this line here, supplement, not supplant. So if I give you an example about that, if we talk about the Gold, uh, the, the gold Discovery Centre at Waihe, that was first being designed when I was working at Waihe in 2008 and it had to be talked about long back as 2006. It's opening in 2014. Had a portion of these royalties from Waihe been going back to that on an annualised basis, maybe we could have done that uh, in a period of say 2011 or 2012 and had it up and running already. Because one thing we don't do is we don't count the costs of delays. And you as local government will know about delays and we also know the cost of not being able to reach and plan for capacity in advance. So retrofitting is always more expensive than planning and putting in in first places and that's what Royalties for Regions is doing for these communities. So um, there's three uh, different areas of expenditure or three funds. Uh, the Regional Infrastructure and Heatworks Fund, Local Government Infrastructure and Capacity and Access to Community and Government Services. Those are the three funds in three areas. So just to show you when this was implemented, that red line shows 2008, 
you can see the huge increase in royalties that happened over that time and that was really the instigator for the National Party to say, hang on, hang on, we need to see some of this coming back to the regions. So clearly this is now the framework by which the regional uh, region for royalties is set up. And I think that these, when I look across New Zealand, my experience as a New Zealand and having lived here and only been an expat for the last five years, <laughs> four years, um, is that this is pretty much regional communities in New Zealand. So whilst the scale may be different, may the, uh, the scope may be different, the distances between communities may be larger, these I think will all fit and uh, signal something to you. And the central principles, strategic pro projects in the regional WR are priority. So when I talk about the individual funds, you'll see that. Local decision making in regional areas is fundamental. And that goes back to, uh, to the concept of local ownership, local identification of priorities, alignment with central government funds or state government uh, priorities as well. State government does the administration in the process. Um, as I said, it's about alignment, not reinvention. It adds value, it increases capacity, it brings forward, um, and it helps the local identified priorities get up off the ground. Now, you have that in play already. You have the, the LTCCP process and the Local Government Act which asks you to do that for your communities as we speak. If you, you don't have to reinvent the wheel in terms of identification of projects and how that might work. You already have a list by which you can pull out <coughs> and edit to. Now what's really interesting is that as we go through this you'll see that the strong emphasis is, was initially on infrastructure but changes over time and the infrastructure was the initial uh, foray into the fund but that allowed things to occur around service provision, economic diversity, health provision and the rest of it. So the Country Local Government Fund, which will be uh, dear to all your heart here from local government, primary objective, address the infrastructure needs of local governments. Now it has widened from that. So infrastructure needs, capacity development, improved asset management. Interestingly enough, this may not be <laughs> something you want to hear, but the state government said it would be really good if you wanted to amalgamate voluntarily, we'll help fund and set that all up and go through the management process around that. I don't hear any claps and loud <laughs> cheers for that. Um, but also, not just councils, but the groups of community local governments coming together. So it could be sub-regional groups coming together and actually identifying things that are important to their sub-regions. So an example of that would be the West of Aopini uh, Smart Growth Project, which I was involved in for about five years. Um, and how we aligned across um, the Regional Council, Western Bay and Tauranga City Council, the alignment of infrastructure services and forward planning, open space, education provision, health and all, all that. I was doing the social implementation of that work. So some of the projects, uh, public housing, and that was a large part of the initial um, focus because affordable housing in those communities when mining came along was suddenly went out the roof. Uh, the prices went through the roof, so the forward land banking and, and uh, release of land and the provision of housing and planning and infrastructure to cope. Uh, swimming pool upgrades, which you'll understand if you've been in any of those places in summer. Um, it's the only place to keep cool. We do water reuse projects, town revitalisation. All of these things that you do as core parts of your business, captured into your LTCCPs is the work of the local government fund. Regional Community Services Fund. So this really is around the service provision and the people focus. So uh, priority services that show effectiveness and enhance and quality of life. Support investment in regional WA and leverage investment for projects that contribute to development of services. Now this has also picked up things like economic uh, development opportunities. So the example of the Gold Discovery Centre in Waihi would be a good example of that. Uh, and it's really about because of the remoteness and the distances between communities and the rationalisation of government services, um, the inability to recruit and retrain talent to help deliver these projects, this is where this area sits. Very much people focused, very much around retaining youth into communities, helping with strategic plans, helping with economic diversity, tourism opportunities, those sorts of things. Um, it does include an allocation for a regional grant scheme. So this is the discretionary component. The other all the other aspects of the fund are not discretionary. They are projects which are put up by re nine regional development commissions, state government agencies and the like, and an independent authority makes recommendations around what projects will be allocated to what fund. So the only discretionary part for the community aspect is this, um, and that includes anything from um, 
aged pension fuel card scheme, regional workers incentive scheme, board and away from home allowance, uh, Aboriginal education programs, uh, roving medical uh, provision, drug and alcohol counselling, the whole works. So all the services we expect uh, to be available to us in urban is about how do we get those out to rural Australia. And community resource centres, clearly a, a key part of that. So the big one is the Regional Infrastructure and Headworks Fund. This is where the majority of the funds are spent. These are the big infrastructure projects by which uh, have priority for WA as a whole. So um, the good example is the, is the Pilbara Cities Initiative, big growth into places like uh, Karratha, Kanara Port, Headland, uh, Newman and the like. So planning, land banking, uh, housing re redevelopments, infrastructure upgrades, all of that work that enabled those communities to actually function. Again, none of these projects were new. <coughs> these were all on the local council's list or on the regional state agency's list. It just allowed them to happen at a faster pace, to happen um, in line with the need or in front of the demand that was coming and allowed them to be added to a capacity that could cater for that in advance and rather than retrofit, all of which you will understand well. Um, the Alder River Irrigation Expansion Project, which opened up a whole uh, agricultural scene, horticulture scene to that area that hadn't otherwise been there. Regional airport upgrades, which then allowed uh, development of tourism opportunities that hadn't been allowed to before. Um, port facilities, super cities planning, arterial roading, those are the big ones. And those are the things that align with not just what's good for that region or that community, but also make sense to the WA, re uh, WA state as a whole. Now there's real opportunity there to do the same thing around alignment of central government uh, policy initiatives for regions in New Zealand and the delivery at a local level. Um, how is it administered uh, by the Department of Regional Development? Uh, it works, as I said, with all the development commissions, nine of them are around the area. They, they're kind of like your economic development agencies that most of you have um, at a localised level or the regional uh, level that you have here in, in um, New Zealand. Communities are very involved through the local government process, businesses and industry, the whole works. But it's the independent advisory body, uh, the Development Trust, which actually makes the allocations to that. And they have two roles. They advise the Minister on the allocations of funds to those projects, but they also allocate on the management of that fund. Because, uh, to put that into context, there has been um, three and a half thousand projects, $4.2 billion allocated since the commencement of this. Um, but only 2.6 billion has been expended. So some projects haven't come online yet, and um, so the fund that sits there obviously is making interest and being invested to, to that in advance. So, um, basically what I just said. In the first years of the royalties program, uh, the first expenditure was $119 million. Uh, within five years it's now 2.6 billion, and a further 2 billion allocated but not expended. So that's the 4.2 over 3,500 individual projects. And they range from everything, from the massive um, Ord River irrigation projects, regional uh, airport upgrades, Pilbara Cities Initiative, right through to delivery of um, education, um, uh, retainment of Aboriginal communities, right through to um, Meals for Real Services and local Karratha Community Centre. So they really range across that. So some of the uh, areas, these are the nine regions. Um, interesting enough, one of the questions we had today was does the proportion of money spent in the regions account for the amount of production that comes out of that region? And the answer is no. Um, that's why they have that independent authority to make decisions about best need, best fit for strategic priorities, best fit for uh, economic and social development. So it's taken out of the hands of the Commission and placed with that independent authority. And um, whilst there's a lot of money in the Pilbara, because that's where the iron ore comes from, um, the wheat belt in South West where we operate is also quite significant in air projects. And the Kimberley obviously another big iron ore area. And in terms of what sort of projects, really interesting, housing has been the biggest provider. Now again that's on a downward trend because the initial need for infrastructure around communities was at housing level to cater for uh, affordable housing abilities, cater for workforce development, to actually cater for, to bring people into work at government services and provision of those communities. <clears throat> but if you look, you'll also see um, health quite high at 12%, community at 13 um, So when you look at the infrastructure components, they're not, they're not large in and of themselves when they're broken down. Um, so some numbers around that. Um, you can read that. 
But again, across those areas of agriculture, health, community support services, and, and this here becomes increasingly clear. Oops, sorry, my apologies. Initially around infrastructure, but if you look at the number, it's actually in the community support services. When you add sports and recreation to that, education, health, these are all service provision, not necessarily infrastructure. The infrastructure is there, and it has been the initial part of that, but once the infrastructure is in place, that is the platform to then go on and deliver the services to build resilience in those communities. And particularly for mining communities, what they are most worried about is that when you take out, for example, 26% of the GDP of a town when a mine closes, what's left behind? This is a forward investment ensuring that what's left behind is actually enabling it to be resilient and cope with that level of change. And what we've seen, particularly with the downturn in commodity prices, and I think all of you have got mining operations, is that once you have a downturn in commodity prices, it can happen overnight, happen in a very short space of time, and affects your employment numbers, your production levels, the royalties that return your income. Now, how do you set up a community to be resilient to that and deal with those changes? Um, so here are the survey outcomes. I'm racing through this, but that's cool. You're about to ask lots of questions. Um, so communities are expected to benefit from the projects. That was one of the key identical pr principles. Um, it's aimed at sustainability. I, as a mining professional, don't talk about sustainability in mining. I think it's we're not sustainable. We're, we're a finite industry. Once the resource is gone, we move on. But we can leave behind a resilient community. And I think that's the kind of thinking you're starting to see through. And I'll explain that further um, as we get on. Um, <clears throat> Long-term viability of regional towns rest on them remaining relevant to current and future populations. Now that is an absolute challenge for all of you in this room today. So as I said, scale much bigger, dollars much bigger, numbers much bigger, distance much bigger, issues exactly the same. So you know, I would uh, consider that when you look at those bullet points, all of these you are facing in the regions of New Zealand today. So what, what they found in talking to communities was that they were seeking to reduce the loss of resources, people and services that are needed to maintain a healthy community. Not because of mining, but because they live in regional and rural Australia. And that mining and is the opportunity for the royalties and the revenue that comes from those regions to come back and test and deal with some of these issues. So it wasn't mining that created that, it was forces associated with economic globalisation, rationalisation of government community services, commodity prices, all of those things that exist today, whether you're from Gisborne, Northland, Coromandel, West Coast, right, regional New Zealand have the same issues. Maybe different drivers, but the same issues. And I suggest most of these drivers are the same. And interestingly enough, having worked uh, in Ghana, uh, Solomon Islands, Papua New Guinea, Indonesia, and Australia, and New Zealand, these are all true. Doesn't matter where we go, they are all true. Um, survey outcome, collaboration was the key. So most projects were a collaborative effort to identify them, prioritise them, put them forward to the Development Commission. And I think that is a pretty key fundamental uh, aspect of the Local Government Act. I think it's pretty much a fundamental aspect of the way New Zealand uh, operates and should be operating. And it certainly is a fundamental aspect of how Newmont operates uh, in terms of how we have tried to deal with this issue of closure and resilience. Um, state government agencies are all, uh, are all involved, but the Development Commissioners were the principal decision makers local community groups involved. And the whole basis behind all that is that when local community are involved in decision making and governance, they're more able to access issues, identify the priorities and actually make sure things happen. Now one of the experiences we had in Waihe is that community are very good at doing all these things. They're very good at being involved, they're very good at making decision making, they'll turn up, they'll give you ideas, they'll volunteer their time, they'll volunteer their thoughts, they'll put down hours and effort and tears and sweat and blood. But when it comes to implementing some of these things that are service orientated or government service orientated, it gets very difficult for a volunteer community member to start putting those things in place. It's a different level of skill set, it's a different level of, of authority, and it's a different level of foresight and planning that's required. So again, our experience in WA is Communities can do all the first part, but the implementation and delivery actually has to be delivered through a fund, through resources, through the right skill sets of getting people on the ground to do this work. Um, so here are some, some data from that. 82% of all the projects thus far were meeting the objectives, but what was really interesting is when they looked at who was benefiting. 
Aboriginal communities, seniors, school aged, people with a disability. Now clearly um, one project will hit multiple uh, audiences but that's probably not the list of people you're expecting to see benefiting from the royalties. You're probably thinking business organisations, economic development, business people, industry associations, and it's not. And I think that that again is a fundamental principle that re or a fundamental outcome that results from local communities being involved. They did find that uh, investment back into those communities also attracted further investment. Um, so if I give you an example of Boddington, um, Boddington's a small community, 1,200 people. We want to try and get more people living in Boddington, but our workforce tell us, look, you know, the schooling's not that good. There's only one cafe and the coffee's pretty bad. There's not a hairdresser. You know, I have to travel. So when we start investing in those communities through the Super City Fund, you start to see private investors coming. Now there's two cafes. Now there's a, a change in the schooling and the headmaster and the governance in the school. There's a change in the in provision of health services there. So slowly we're starting to put these things in place which are fundamental to then attracting a community and keeping a community. And again, I think those things are probably ringing bells for most of the year. Uh, enhancing community confidence really, um, once you've got the adequate infrastructure in place and, the, and you've got those services coming on a regular basis that make sense for your community, you can then go on and establish further outcomes and set the policies to require. Community vitality and resilience, really, um, I've been talking about this for a, a long time, um, for, well, since, the, since today, uh, I've been talking about that to you as a message. Um, but what's really interesting is that even these communities that benefited from the boom times in the minerals sector, when it was going absolutely nuts, uh, and, and if you were living over there and working on it, it was, was a crazy time. Um, they're now adjusting to a structural change where you've got reduced workforce, reduced commodity income, um, <clears throat> you've got less contracting opportunities out there in the local community. The change of that community is quite dramatic. And again, as I said, it happens quickly and it happens overnight in the commodities. Which, and that's not even untrue for commodities such as milk and in the dairy industry. When the farmers don't get their payouts as high as they'd like them to be, the spending in those local communities is less. It may not be as, as uh, high and low as the mineral sector, but it has an impact on those communities. Oh, sorry. So, three key challenges, and again, if you're involved in the sustainability debates in New Zealand or in local government, this will not be news to you. How to be economically productive, how to be socially viable, how to keep ecological sustainability. And the codependence and the balance of those three things is integral to this. So, why do we care about it? You're a mining company, so what? Um, read this book, Resilience, by a guy by the name of Andrew Zoldi. Uh, this pretty much set the path for how I think and what we do now across Newmont, well, within the Asia Pacific region anyway, how we operate. Um, this has been a fundamental aspect of what uh, I've been trying to put in place with our teams, so Seth and Darby, and Wahi, now Andrew and Jury, and all of our uh, operations. It's really about, that's a nice fancy educative type uh, quote, but what it really means is can communities cope with the amount of change that comes out of the mineral sector, or any sector? Read this book, this by a guy uh, by the uh, name Adam Warchek, he was the youngest ever uh, president of the Sierra Club, which is a, a very green conservation based uh, organisation in the US, very powerful conservation lobby group, who realised that if we're really going to make a difference to sustainability, business needs to be involved in this and has to have a conscience around this and manage its impacts. He's been told he's sold out, um, but when you read this, you can see that it actually makes a lot of sense. Um, and he talks about these things, that um, business can identify and, and mitigate its negative impacts, but also leverage its positive impacts. And I, don't, and I think the point that we're making around royalties for regions is where you get alignment between industry, who already involve themselves in community investment, local government, whose core purpose, and if the royalties came back, reinvestment back into those same projects. When you start getting that alignment and adding depth to projects and adding <coughs> depth to initiatives and services, you start to get change. What we continually see is that we deliver services and projects very thinly to lots of people to make lots of people happy. Um, and what we're saying here under Royalties of Regions is let's make some priority projects and add value to them so they get up off the ground and we can then move on to the next one. So what's the difference between sustainability and resilience? Um, quite simply, sustainability assumes there's a point of equilibrium and that once you achieve that you can't go past it. Um, 
and that's that's quite a good ide ideology. I think that's fair. But the problem is it doesn't account for what happens if things change outside of the control that changes that point of equilibrium. How do we deal with that? Resilience is a, is a our philosophy is more about how do we actually provide the community and individuals with enough skills and ability to actually deal with that change as it comes. So they basically like scenario planning. How do we know what we can do to pick it up? So when a mine closes, what is the economic diversity for that town? How do we keep 80% of those 400 workers from leaving Waihi? How do we stop a school closing because there's a couple of less kids? How do we stop one less cafe happening? All those sorts of issues. In that line there, I, I love this line, if we can't control the volatile tides of change, we must learn to be better boat builders. And we're seeing that, right? Climate change is happening beyond our control, uh, growth in developing countries, demand for uh, product uh, from emerging markets, um, economic globalisation, all of those things that are happening need to be dealt with on a basis of resilience and actually dealing with that and changing behaviours. So why is this useful for this discussion? Well, funny enough, um, as I said, the scale may be different, but the issues are exactly the same. And I've just taken, all I've done here is I've taken out the Western Australian references, and I was asked you to read that in terms of where you sit in your communities and the challenges you face. And I suggest that they're probably the same or similar. The bullet points may have different, between each community, there may be degrees of, um, of different driving drivers, but Effectively, those things will be affecting you all. So, relevance to New Zealand, the World Bank research tells us um, that most um, communities around the world, most global markets, are actually moving to this where uh, affected communities can share directly back um, from the royalties that come out of that. New Zealand doesn't do that at the moment, so it's not up with world best practice. As I said, LTCC plans already have a uh, process in place. And not just at the council level, but think cross council, groupings, region, and work out how you might work and do that. And, and you do that already. I, I, we know you do around roading, we know you do around infrastructure, we know you do that. So again, the concepts that sit behind royalties for regions aren't new to you. It's just the application of a fund to actually make them happen. The alignment of existing regional or local priorities with central government is key. But what's missing is the funding from the revenue that's generated from those regions. If that went back, or a portion of that went back, could you do those projects, get them up faster? Could you add them more capacity? Could you get more service delivery? Because that's a longer term thinking. And the argument we keep hearing is, oh yeah, but then we, uh, you know, why would we do that for one community? Because unlike other communities that have dairy or forestry that are sustainable in the terms of the resource that they are exploiting, resources finish, they are finite. And when they close, we know the impact. So why not pre-plan for that in advance and try and mitigate the impact of that so that you're not having to throw a whole lot more money further on down the track when it's more expensive, when people have already fallen off the cliff. And I think that's got to be a key long-term thinking outcome around this. And um, so and my point to that is every community that we operate in has ups and downs, peaks and troughs, whether it's tourism, forestry, dairy prices, when the farmers don't get their commodity prices. My dad's a farmer, I'd say that. Um, you know, so they don't buy a new car, they don't go and get as much feed, all those things. <clears throat> Fundamental too originally as well, just throw that in there. Um, but with commodities, those peaks and troughs can be a lot higher, and they're a lot closer together, and they can happen a lot faster. So where things are kind of even, we don't need to worry too much. But where things aren't even, or they happen fast, we need to build some resilience. And I think the concept of doing this in a way that allows revenue that comes from those regions to come back and even out this line is kind of key. And I haven't heard that argument come out of this forum yet, and I think it's one that you should pick up and run with, because I think it would get huge um, gravitas in your communities. Um, so this is the Eglinton model of social investment. So just to show you, because people go, oh, the argument I've heard is that, oh, but well, that means that uh, industry then won't put any money into community investment. Well, that's untrue. Uh, in Australia, the community investment, the discretionary fund is still $300 million out of the gold sector. And Waihe Gold still funds something around $2 million an annum into in discretionary funds. But wouldn't it be great if we could align our funding on an annualised basis to your priorities that also have government priorities and when we start thinking about closure somewhere along we're always thinking about building that resilience concept 
And whilst initially it may just be a small part of our budget, it suddenly becomes a big part of our focus. That's forward thinking and that's the model we've been trying to push forward. Now what's really interesting is that in emerging markets, whether we're in Ghana or industry, uh, Indonesia, this actually is a requirement of their regulatory of their uh, permit processes. Industry is actually required to do this. So when we think about our environmental impacts and our water, when we do uh, work up in Indonesia, we have to start planning for this in advance. So this um, is not new to the industry. It's not something that we're all going to blanch at. It's something that we're doing internationally and we're not doing it here. We are doing it voluntarily in Waihi. I'm not sure how many others are. Um, so here's a framework, my, my suggested framework, right? Portion of royalties returns, local decision making, opportunity for groups of TLAs to come together, builds on existing plans, supplements, not supplants, recreates or invents, in alignment with federal priorities. Pretty good framework. If you can do that, identify what those projects are and line those three bodies up and you get some funding back, that'd be kind of useful. Why is it good for us? Well, it contributes to that resilience in advance. It adds value to the work we're already trying to do. Um, forward preparation for eventual mine closure. Aligns with current um, discretionary uh, funding that we already put forward, as I said. And look, let's be honest about this. It does assist with the dialogue in New Zealand around mining. And, and I don't think we should be afraid of that. I mean, at the moment, the debate around mining, and um, I have the scars from 2009. Um, I was at the forefront of that uh, whole debate around mining and conservation parks. You can't get away from it. Um, Chris has got a few <laughs> as well. And um, the thing that appalled me about it was the debate was black and white. It was diametrically opposed. It was never about, well, hang on, what are the benefits? How might the benefits accrue? And we were talking about this aspect back then. So as a company, we were talking about this. And it does help with acceptance. So I think we've got to um, have that dialogue. And this might be a useful um, platform to have that. Likewise, whilst National have come out and said, we don't think this is a good project, clearly they have an oil and gas and minerals extraction agenda. National, uh, that's part of their policy platform. If this helps the acceptance and dialogue with communities, which is one of the biggest blockers to getting mining projects up, why wouldn't you want to accept this? And again, I haven't heard that debate yet happen from this forum, so that might be something we want to talk about. Um, so quickly, last two slides, because I can see people yawning and going to sleep, um, which I know is no reflection on my presentation. But um, in Ghana, um, the partnership between Ghana Gold and the Ahafo Social Responsibility Forum, as I said, this is not new in emerging markets. We do this uh, all the time. And uh, the Newmont Ahafo Development Foundation, or NADEF, terrible acronym, um, has community ownership. So there's eight members on the board, four from the community, uh, and four from Newmont, so it's equal allocation. And we allocate one dollar from every ounce of gold sold and one percent of the annual net profit to fund that foundation. Now, people say, oh, well, that's straight out of your budget. No, uh, yes, it is, but it's also been negotiated with the government as a way of local royalties, so we pay less of the royalty. So in some countries, you can actually negotiate your royalty payments if you put up so much money from your straight operating budget, and it comes off your royalty payment to the government. But the point is, it's local, and it's on local priorities, and it's delivered. So the mechanism is, is quite different, and the funding mechanism is quite different, but the overall amounts are the same. Um, so uh, just some numbers, $70 million for sustainable development projects in 10 communities. Um, if you go to Ghana, fantastic place. West Africa, great. I mean, the boulder at the moment, granted, but go to West Africa. It's a fantastic place. Um, we just had Nigerian government out with us. Um, yeah, look, West Africa, is, I can't talk, I'll talk about that in another forum. But, um, so infrastructure projects, now clearly that's going to be a big part in an emerging market where the infrastructure just does not exist. So, again, why do mining companies care about this? So, if you want healthy workforce and not be sick from preventable communicable diseases, you want to have running wastewater and sewerage and water treatment. Because that's the biggest health issue that they, let's fix that. We have a healthy workforce, we have less sick days. Um, Indonesia, infant mortality rates under three years old was really, really high in Zimbabwe. We've gone in, we've helped that work, we've, we've now so basically sold that issue to nil. Uh, malaria control used to account for about 50% of our absentee workforce. 
malaria is almost eradicated. So all of these development challenges also have a business outcome. And again, I think we've got to be open about that. It's, it's good for us because of, of these reasons. It's good for you because of those reasons. Um, so that's Ghana. And finally, this is the Tanawai. Now, the reason I just wanted to show you this was for um, with treaty settlements uh, in New Zealand and, for example, in the Coromandel, uh, under treaty settlement, when that was finalised, um, the uh, Iwi will be our biggest land um, landowner. It will be our biggest rent landlord. And um, there are parts of Iwi up in the Coromandel who would willingly work with us on partnership to see how this would go. Um, now the way this works in WA, and this is going to be really interesting for you all, is that our land that we operate on in the middle of the desert is Aboriginal freehold land. They own it. They have title on it, it has a value to it, and um, it's part of, it was part of the initial uh, Lands Act of 1970s and then through the Mabo Act of 19, uh, 1993. And that's a big deal, right? Because in Australia, land uh, native title was, was only recognised in 1993. And it was only originally recognised in the 70s. So all of that big space in the middle used to be just known as kind of vacant land. And so to actually have freehold land that has a value and it has massive resources on it is a huge opportunity for the Aboriginal communities. <coughs> now, the, because of the, its freehold Aboriginal land, the state government, um, part of the deal was they don't get any royalties. So they can't do it on a production basis. But, but the Aboriginal communities can, and they do it on a production level. So they, they pay, we pay a certain rate, um, which I'm not allowed to tell you how much that is, um, but we, we pay it from, from different commodities we pull out of the ground. Even the gravel we use, we pay on a production rate, and that money goes into their projects and is distributed. The interesting part is that the Australian government, <coughs> under the Lands Act, are required that when we make it, the way that the Northern Territory government, sorry, takes its royalty is purely from profit, so it is like a tax. We make no profit, they get no income. Um, but when we do make a profit, and the Tanami is now a very profitable mine, they get a lot of income. What happens then is that the Australian government, in lieu of the fact that they didn't provide um, native title until 1993, actually pays an equivalent amount into the Aboriginal benefits accounts, with 30% of which goes to the, directly to the Aboriginal communities and under a, a, a forum called GMAC, which is a combination of all representatives of the Aboriginal communities and the Land Council and the, and the, um, and the uh, company. So that's another type of local sharing benefit that happens because Indigenous communities own the land and has huge benefit for that. And again, very fortunately, they've just had a uh, evaluation of those programs. And again, same principles. Local projects are identified by local communities, alignment between, um, in this case, alignment between the funds and this account and local communities and the company, delivery of objectives into those communities. And these are remote communities. I mean, most Australians haven't been there. I'd, again, if you ever get a chance to go into remote Australia and visit Aboriginal community, please go and do so. It'll open your eyes. Um, and I think that's it. Thank you very much. Great. Thanks, Calvin. Um, Look, I'll tell you a couple of quick questions. Uh, just as a program, uh, we're going to hear from a local uh, couple uh, locally, uh, and he might uh, is going to talk about how it affects them locally in the living of the community. Uh, we're going to have a break, and uh, we're going to hear a couple of other speakers, and then we're going to have a panel. We're going to get them all up here for questions and answers. But I'm always afraid to open it up to the floor when there's a few politicians in one of them. Uh, but is there anyone that might I have one or two quick questions that they'd like to ask of Kelvin? particularly around clarification, rather than get into the debate. Is anyone at the moment?